Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Karen uh, from Docker. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I first have a question. Uh, who all is this your first Docker meetup? Oh, wow. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. Well, welcome. I'm glad that you could come. Um, I just briefly wanted to introduce two people to you. Um, we have two new organizers for our group from our community. And uh, Louisa previously was an organizer for our Docker New York group. And Sylvain is a super attendee of our Docker group here in San Francisco. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, and I was going to do an intro. Hi, I'm Louisa. Um, if you have any questions for me, let me know. Or if you want to get involved, I guess, also. Um, yeah, I previously organized the NYC meetup. I moved to San Francisco a few months ago to join a company called Front as a software engineer. Um, and I'm helping out with the meetup here, so I'm really excited. And it's always great to see new people attending the meetup for the first time. So welcome, everyone. Um, this is Sylvain. He's a, a coworker of mine. Uh, Hi, I'm Sylvain. Uh, I've been monitoring uh, at Docker for a while now, so if you have questions, you can ask me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a bit much. Great. And uh, just real quickly, I wanted to give a shout out to our sponsors for the food and beverage tonight. Um, thank you so much, Code Work and Code Ship. Sorry, Code Ship and Weave Works um, for coming. Yes. Thank you. Great. So uh, we'll get started with our first speaker. So we have uh, Kelly Andrews. He's a developer advocate at CodeShip. Uh, when he's not busy defending JavaScript, you can find him singing karaoke, performing music, or cheering for the fighting Irish. He's going to be giving a talk uh, titled Docker from Development to Production. Yay, thank you. <laughs> One second while we switch adapters. Thanks, Mac. Ooh. Hey, it works. All right, so it won't take very long. Uh, yeah, so if anybody knows where I can sing karaoke right after this, let me know. I'm on my way. Uh, big fan. If anybody wants to go with me, absolutely. It'd be a great night. Um, not even kidding. Everybody always like, oh, were you serious? Yeah, I'm absolutely serious. Let's go. Um, first, let's talk Docker. So a whole bunch of new people tonight, which is awesome. Uh, between like one and three on a skill level of like five, right? Five being Docker expert, one being Docker newbie. How many are like between like one and three? Yes, my content's actually going to work. So those people who didn't raise their hand, you can like each pizza, chat for a minute. Uh, this would be a little boring, but it, it's kind of an introduction, which is good. Um, I mean, I've kind of only been doing Docker since uh, about February, and I come back from the background of using like Dreamweaver to switch my between my different production environments, staging and development, and checking code in and out manually, and it was really nasty and. Uh, so I've always kind of done things on my machine and directly on my dev machine uh, without really much consideration for, you know, how easy Docker actually was. Um, and now that I'm doing Docker, I'm actually really happy that I, I, I started because it makes life a lot easier. Um, quick thing before we move forward, uh, I do want to kind of uh, brag about my family a little bit. Uh, these are my Two of my kids and my new, our new dog, we just got Sunday. I just uh, heard you were mentioning you got a new dog as well, which I thought was kind of ironic. But uh, this is Rizzo, uh, named after Anthony Rizzo of the Cubs. Uh, so if there's any San Francisco Giants fans in here, uh, I don't apologize. Um, 
These are two of my six kids. I actually have six kids, and people ask, how do you have six kids? I travel a lot. <laughs> if you want to talk more about that, we can do it at, over a beer at karaoke. Not kidding. Okay, so let, what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about uh, using Docker in development. Using Docker with like continuous integration, because I am from CodeShip. We have some Circle guys back here. Woo, Circle. All right. You guys can leave. I'm just kidding. And then deployment. <laughs> totally kidding. You're more, no, you're more than welcome. I'm just teasing. You'd say the same thing to me. Maybe not. Deployment. Uh, then we'll get to Docker on deployment. I'm sorry. I'm in a mood. Um, karaoke afterwards, though. Seriously. Uh, so what is Docker? Now, most everybody here is going to know what Docker is, right? Docker is a container platform that lets you uh, package up your applications into an image, ship that image, and run it as a container. What's a container? Well, it's all those pieces that you need to run your application in a small little package uh, that runs pretty much anywhere, right? So it's, it's pretty straightforward. What it helps is with development side of things, it really help streamline the whole process by eliminating a lot of the issues that happen machine to machine, right? The whole works on my machine thing. So let's talk a little bit more about using Docker for development. So in kind of the overall development pipeline, this is gonna be sort of the, inner, like the first part of the whole process, right? This is where the brunt of the work happens. And even though these things are all sort of equal uh, development is probably going to take up most of this um, actual pipeline here, but uh, we're going to talk mostly here in the beginning. We'll start with the, with the very beginning. So what kinds of things does it do to help us? Uh, first one is like a defined environment as code, right? So I'm able to write down in a file that ex expressly says this is how my environment should be built, how things should run, what it looks like any specific instructions that need to happen before I run my application, it's all gonna be there. And this helps us out because now we can share that code between other developers and everybody can use that, uh, use that Docker file, and I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a second, but the uh, Docker file to, to actually build out your environments uh, equally, right? Everybody has the same thing, it's not a bunch of different uh, setups, it's not a bunch of different configurations or dependencies, that kind of thing. So it, it helps us sort of standardize the way our environments are set up. So environmental consistency. Now, between dev machine to dev machine is one thing, but actually going from dev to prod and having those environments be as close to the same as possible, Docker helps us get there because we actually have that ability to write up an image that gets shipped to production, and we're also writing that directly on development and running it locally as well. So they, throughout the entire process, it's basically the same image that can be ran, and we know it's always going to be consistent uh, for us in that regard. Where we always got stuck back in the past, right, is dev would be my machine, staging would be slightly different than my machine, but nowhere near what production was, and then you'd have to run some scripts to actually get what works on staging to work on production, and it was a mess, right? So this kind of helps eliminate all that. Docker is gonna be your only requirement on your work machine. Uh, you can actually install Docker, and once you have that installed, you can now build your images into containers and run them, and that's it. You don't really have to add a whole lot of other dependencies, which takes me sort of the final piece, which is now you can run multiple versions without installing NVM or RVM, Python 2, Python 3 issues, right? All these different pieces you can sort of go through uh, without having to set everything up and work around all the different configuration issues. Okay, so let's talk Docker Store first before I get uh, a little deeper into this. Before, I, I had tried Docker a couple years back. It was still a little rough on the Mac, and I wasn't a real fan. It took a lot more setup, it seemed, to get running. That's all been sort of smoothed over, and now the, the experience is much better. But what I wasn't really aware of was what, like, the Docker store was for. Uh, and now that I've sort of gotten deeper into it, understanding that Docker store is going to help me find things like the base image using Node, and I can get any version I need in any flavor of Linux, or if I need Postgres or Redis or whatever, 
I can go to the Docker store and find something already created. It also helped me really learn how to write better Docker files because I could go in, check out the Docker files for each one of these images, copy them, emulate them, do what I could to figure out, understand what they were doing. Uh, so it, it kind of helped in two, in two ways, but mostly what this is really great for is now I can use this to install like MongoDB without having to go through the steps of actually installing MongoDB locally and making sure it works. I can use uh, the Docker store to grab an image and, and build off of that. So let's take a look at how some of this all works together. So this is an example of a Docker file and I have a live version of all this that I'll kind of walk through after, the, after we're done with this. Uh, but this takes node 8.6.0 and an Alpine flavor of Linux, which is really stripped down, uh, removes a lot of the unnecessary packages, uh, which produces a smaller image in the, in the end. Um, you have to have the from directive. So the from directive basically says, everything from here on out is going to be using this base image. And if you don't have that up front, it doesn't really know what to start with, so it doesn't really go anywhere. As I move down, what I want to do is I want to go from most stable to least stable or most volatile even. Um, so the second, the second line there is really a, the reasoning for that, before I move ahead, is each time it goes through one of these different steps, it's going to create a cached image on your uh, host. <clears throat> so when you run sub subsequent builds, what will happen is it speeds up because as these things don't change, it uses a cached image. If you do like copy, the copy command that's last at, up top, that's gonna change most often, which means everything will have to be reran every single time because it's not actually taking advantage of the cache system. So you wanna put things that, that break the cache lower in the, in the directives and then at the top do things that will change least. Uh, so at the top I change, I set the working directory to user slash app. Uh, and that will basically just like any other working directory, uh, just sets where I'm at uh, permanently. So from here on out, everything's gonna be in context of that folder. Uh, the second command there is gonna be run. So the next directive is run. Run is very important. Run's gonna actually run a command in the, uh, kind of in the Linux uh, operating system. Uh, so in this case, it's gonna do APK, which is a package management for Alpine. It's gonna update all the packages, make sure it has the latest, and then it's gonna follow that by adding the Postgres, uh, Postgres SQL library, which helps my Node app actually interact with Postgres database. Um, so that's the only real thing I needed for, uh, for Alpine to be up to date and ready to go. And the next one I use is copy, and copy is gonna move files from my host to my container or my image. So on the left side, you see package.json, which is coming directly from the host computer. So it's actually my, just my root folder. And then that copies it over to dot, which is my root folder on the container. There's two different directives to move files. One is copy, one's add. Uh, it's kind of important to note. Uh, I tend to use copy most of the time. Add will allow you to pull from a URL. Uh, it'll also decompress files if they're zipped and that sort of thing. Um, if I'm not doing that, I just use copy by default. So that's just sort of my preference. I see other people use add all the time, but uh, it's kind of a, whatever your preference is. Um, so then the next, uh, next statement, run uh, npm install quiet. And that's exactly what it is. If any of you are node developers with me here, um, it's just running npm install. So that's gonna go through, install everything in my package JSON. Uh, when that's complete, it kind of spits out everything that was installed and that's good to go. Then the last directive there is an, another copy and it's gonna copy everything in my root folder over to my image and then set it up that way. So this all happens during the build of the actual image itself. The final directive, uh, CMD or command, is essentially when that's the default state uh, command that gets ran whenever you run the container, and that's npm start in this instance. Now this is good, and it sets up my application and sets up the Docker file for that. 
And if I share this throughout uh, my dev team, they all have the same instance. But I want to take it a step further, right? This is just my Node app. I want to add some other things. So that's where we started talking about Docker Compose. So Docker Compose allows me to start multiple containers all at the same time, link them together, network, share volumes, whatever I need to do uh, that I would normally would have done, I think before with like a bash script, I would run multiple Docker commands and sort of set it up and it was a very manual process. But for Docker Compose, uh, for me, this is like, this is how I should be developing all the time. Because now I can actually set up an entire environment just like this. So if we look at, I have two services here. One is using, uh, one is called web, and that's my application, and it's building from the root folder with, so the Docker file there that we just looked at. It's replacing the default command with a new one. So in this instance, when I'm building it locally, I can do npm run dev. Right? So as I'm developing, it's gonna set up node mon uh, for all my node, node friends in here. So anytime I change a file, it's gonna restart my server. I don't have to mess with it. It just keeps the, the monitor going there for me, uh, which is the only difference between run dev and start. Then, uh, then I set up volumes, which for me is, um, that's how I connect my host machine to my container as it's running. So during runtime, I can over, I can mount a local directory to my container uh, and have those files mapped to each other. So in this instance, on the left side, I'm mapping my entire root folder to the user app folder. And then I'm also setting up a kind of a workaround, which I've found to work, but it lets me not blow away my node modules folder that I put on the image. Because when you build them out, it builds it all at build time. But if I don't add this line, they disappear on me. Uh, so I, I always have that line in there just to kind of make sure they stick around. Uh, the next one is ports. Uh, again, it's host on the left, container on the right. So my container exposes 3000 to the host's port 3000. So when I call this, I can call localhost 3000 and it calls my box, uh, the container itself, which is running the application on uh, 3000 ports. So and then I have depends on, which is gonna tell uh, the web service, it's gonna tell Docker that when the web service runs, it has to have Postgres start. Um, there's not really much more to say about that. It just depends on Postgres. And then the, uh, the environment variable, you can set up all kinds of environment variables. Uh, you can do it right here in the compose file. You can also set up an environment file the same way uh, and pass that in. Uh, but I only need the one here for database URL. And what this is actually connecting to is the next service, which is Postgres. And that is pulling an image directly from the Docker store, uh, 9.6.2 Alpine. It's all set up and ready to go. Once I, once I pull it down, uh, everything connects to it. And I have my system with a node application calling Postgres all together, just like this. All I need to do to run that is Docker Compose up. It'll build out the web. Uh, it builds out everything, runs through the whole process, sets everything up. Once that's good to go, uh, it'll tell me my application's running and I can call it at that point. Uh, after I kind of get through everything else, I'll sort of review and run through all this locally so you can actually see it work. Let's talk about integration next. Okay, so after, in the deployment pipeline, after the development, you commit some code. That then goes through a continuous integration process if you're doing things appropriately, um, which will then run all of your unit tests or integration tests or anything else you have that you need to test there. And it's gonna do that during the time. It's uh, just before you merge everything back together, it'll test everything to make sure that those changes are okay. So how does Docker help us here? Well, it lets us test with clean environments since they're ephemeral, um, basically they're throwaway, right? So that allows me to, every time I run a new test, it's a new environment. It's brand, it, it's clean, I don't have leftovers, I don't have any issues with some other artifact that may be affecting my testing. Uh, I can run any of my CI requirements. If it fits into a container, I can run it. I can do that at any step in a process. 
again, with the environmental consistency, and this is kind of a common theme for me, but environmental consistency with Docker is probably the biggest thing for me is uh, my testing environment is like my dev environment is like my production environment. They all work together. Uh, I can automate more things now that I'm inside Docker and using Docker. I just, it's the ability to set up some scripting that will actually run all my pieces and, and test all, run all my tests and verify everything uh, code wise to make sure I'm doing exactly what I need to do. So yes, I'm from CodeShip. So there's the obligatory CodeShip uh, image, but essentially what what we're going to do at this point is integrate in the Docker containers to run through uh, our system. And our setup is very similar to the actual Docker Compose file we just looked at as well. Uh, so we have a service file and then we have a steps file which defines the pipeline. I'll show you that next. Uh, but in this one, same sort of thing, we have a, a web service that uh, when I build that, it's gonna use the Docker file. Docker file path is another, um, another way that I can point to a specific Docker file. A lot of times when you sort of get more complex in your setup, you may have a test Docker file, you may have a production Docker file, you may have a development uh, Docker file. Just depends on your actual needs, uh, but there's no like cut and dry answer on what you need, um, it's sort of based on your own thing. Uh, when it gets built, it's actually going to produce an image, uh, registry.heroku.com slash todos dash js slash web, which will come into play when we deliver this and actually deploy it to Heroku containers uh, later. Uh, we use links on CodeShip uh, because we're working on not using links right now, but right now we use links, uh, which links it up to Postgres. And then we have the environment variable from before, and then you can cache the image for later. If nothing changes, it'll just reuse the same image over, which makes things a lot faster. Uh, again, I use the same Postgres image and cache that as well, although most of, the, most of those are already cached, but uh, I just add that in there just to make sure. And that's it. It's a little simpler than the other one because everything that's running, I don't need to expose the ports, uh, I don't need to expose volumes because everything's sort of self-contained at this point. I don't have to actually do anything or interact with the host like I did when I'm developing because I'm not changing files on the fly and trying to see how those changes uh, happen in the container. And then with my steps, I have two parallel steps, one, one for a lint and one for my tests. Now you notice under tests, I have a, a bin folder with a CI that there, there's a subtle issue that you might hit and it's called timing or race case where uh, so you have to check and make sure Postgres is up and running. Um, if you're trying to run a test and you're doing it uh, on your machine, you, you can wait until Postgres is up and running. Uh, if you're automating it, you need to make sure it's running before you do anything or everything fails, right? So you don't wanna do that. So you write a small little script just says, is you know PG is ready, uh, which is a tool directly from Postgres. Uh, if that's ready, gives me the thumbs up. Otherwise, it waits a couple of seconds and then uh, fires it again. <clears throat> Once those all pass, then I know that my integration tests have all passed. I can merge my code into master. It's all good to go. Um, but this is all through using Docker containers uh, inside CodeShip directly. Once I have all that written, uh, before I actually push uh, my code to our repository uh, in GitHub, I can run jet steps, which actually runs through the whole process locally and tells me if everything's gonna work. Uh, it's just like running Docker Compose up, but it actually goes through the entire process with the code chip uh, files uh, in front of it to make sure, make sure if you have any issues, you kind of catch those before you're doing a bunch of testing if this works, sort of commits. All right, so let's talk about using Docker for deployment. So how does Docker help us in deployment? Uh, environmental consistency. Be honest, who knew that was coming? Anybody? A couple of you? Anybody paying attention? Pizza's really good, so if you're, on, if you're not napping by now, I'm not sure why not. <clears throat> um, environmental consistency, again, dev to prod, same thing, right? 
all the way across the board, I'm using the same image, the same containers, they're all looking the same, it's all the same code, I know it's all gonna run the same. Uh, I can deploy the containers anywhere. If I have a host that runs Docker, I can deploy it there. It doesn't matter if it's Azure, AWS, Google, DigitalOcean, Heroku, my own machine, whatever, right? If I have an ability to deploy it there, I can do that. Uh, they are scalable now. I mean, the, the Docker Swarm stuff is just awesome. Uh, so the scalability there, uh, it just containers in general uh, lend themselves to that scalability factor. You can run mo more than one container. They're so lightweight uh, that it's not uh, a big deal at that point. And the, again, the image is the entire package, so I don't have to set up a machine somewhere outside of, you know, the, the normal like security stuff you're gonna wanna do and you have to have the Docker host ready to go. But I don't have to go in and make sure it has all the right uh, dependencies. I don't need to make sure that the configuration is correct. Uh, everything happens within my container, so it all gets shipped and it's all good to go. So we're gonna look at the rest of the deployment pipeline here, staging through production. Uh, going back to our services file with CodeShip, all I have to do is just drop in uh, another image. And this is what I was talking about earlier with anything you'd wanna do uh, in a container, anything you can run in a container, you can do here. Uh, and then during your entire CI build, CI CD pipeline. <clears throat> so in this instance, we have a config generator uh, that will uh, basically log me into Heroku and produce all the credentials I need. Once I have that, then I can actually run a step to push uh, the entire image that I just produced. So where you see image name, that's the same image I just built out in the uh, previous step. So once I have that, it just pushes everything out to Heroku. Heroku takes the image from there, updates everything, and we're good to go uh, as long as everything deploys okay on their end. So I can test this again. I can do jet steps, push, tag master, which will run through the entire process. If everything works, it'll actually push it locally from, from my own box, uh, which is kind of cool. And then I can get commit and get push which then runs through the entire process uh, remotely. And that's, at that point, my, my pipeline is sort of built, right? Now, anytime somebody wants to commit new code, they submit a PR, that PR gets checked by my tests. If the tests pass, we merge it in. If it's master, it deploys it. And we're, we're sort of, we're in a good shape at that point. So let's go over here. kind of walk through a little bit here. Old man, oh, live demo. Yeah. Woo, fingers crossed. Uh, okay, so we'll do Docker Compose up. Docker Compose up. This is not gonna go well. <laughs> okay, so everything's cached, right? Because I cached it earlier because I'm smart. Uh, and we don't have to sit here and watch them build. <laughs> but essentially at this point, I can go to localhost 3000 and we can all see the Todos app because I'm highly unoriginal. So Todos, sing karaoke. Seriously, if anybody has a hot tip on where to go. I've been to the Mint before a few times, so I'm always good with that, but if there's any new places, more than happy. Uh, okay, so this is all working, it's all local. How do I know it's working? Uh, because I'm still getting my same deprecation warning from PG Connect, because um, it's gotta be upgraded again. <laughs> JavaScript. I defend it, I also hate it. So. Um, so let's have a look at like, what kinds of things I can do locally. I can do Docker Compose, Run, RM, Web, SH. Okay, so my Docker Compose says, it depends on Postgres, that's why you see it's starting Postgres there. But if I actually look at this, this is just a Linux, Linux operating system. There's no VM, all the, all the stuff for all the extra junk that you normally get with like a VM, none of that's here. This is all just sort of the operating system and pretty, pretty small. Uh, but all my files are here. If I do uh, npm 
npm is here, node, node is here. It's, how do you exit? It's like them. <sighs> cool, so everything's here. I, if I wanna do uh, npm test, yep, npm test, it'll run it here. Some of this might work. Yeah, yeah, so everything passed, 24 passed, cool, right? So I can do all this, I can do all this locally just by sort of running a command with Docker Compose, uh, which is essentially at drop, it, I just drop myself into this shell. So the, um, the command I ran is just sh at the end. So you have Docker Compose, oh, you guys can't hardly see that, it's at the bottom. Um, Docker Compose run, uh, RM is gonna remove the containers when, I, when I'm done. And then I run the web service, which we defined in the compose file. And then I run SH, which just does, um, drops me into the actual shell of Linux there. If I wanted to do something else, essentially this is my way of sort of doing one-time commands uh, at any point. So kind of convenient. And then uh, from here, I can show you the jet steps. And we'll do a push. And I'm gonna go ahead and leave it cached. So it'll run through those whole steps, which you see here. Um, Got work. Pushing. Pushed, yes. All right, uh, see, I got a last type, finish success. Everything worked. It goes over to my Heroku app, which ironically looks exactly the same as my other app. Environmental consistency, people. It's all the same stuff. It's really convenient. Sing, karaoke, oh, really? Oh, it's refreshing now. Thanks, Heroku. Sing, karaoke, interrupted my joke which are all terrible, by the way, so they don't get any better. Um, so that, yeah, so now I have uh, everything on Heroku. It's all built in a container. It's just like the container I developed in. It's just like the container I tested in, top to bottom, it's all identical, which is super awesome. Uh, and it makes my life a lot less uh, headachey. I don't know the right word. I lost my word right there, I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, so essentially uh, I duplicated a slide and didn't change this. So what's, what happened? This is live, live presentation at its finest. So what happened? Anybody tell me, we talked about the development, talked about continuous integration. We talked about all the environmental consistencies between these two steps all the ways to write a file, share between your entire dev team, and they all have the same environment. Uh, every time you do a c commit and a PR, it's gonna run everything inside these containers. And then we can deploy, we can deploy to Heroku, we can deploy to Amazon, we can deploy wherever, uh, just wherever we want it to go to. If I can write some scripting to make that happen inside a Docker container, it's gonna happen. This is my blog page uh, from CodeShip. So I run through a few examples of sort of how to get started. Uh, so if you're really a, a noob and you wanna learn how to kind of dockerize maybe a Node, Ruby, or PHP app, I have those three examples out there. I have a Python example that's still in the queue. Eventually it'll get out. Um, but some other fun stuff in there that I blogged about, so feel free to visit that and check it out. Uh, my Twitter handle is Kelly J Andrews at the bottom. Feel free to follow me. Uh, unless you want to flame me, then feel free to block me. That's fine. Um, other than that, it, I guess we can open it up to questions. Uh, I have no idea how long I just took. It feels like I was up here forever, but no, I got actually really, really good timing. So four minutes, a few more minutes. We'll say four minutes, one question. <laughs> Make it count, yeah. Uh, there's a couple of, I mean, there's multiple ways to go about it. I always have a hard time giving advice on like your workflow because everybody's workflow is different. Um, 
Usually what's gonna happen is you have some sort of build process that will create an artifact. So what I kind of glossed over is you could push this out to like Docker Hub or some other Docker registry. This is using the, the, the Heroku registry, which basically then just deploys it right away. You could have an intermittent step, which is technically continuous delivery, which is not actually deployment, but it's the one piece left is deploying. So what you'll do is every time you have like a development team build, code gets merged, builds happen, artifacts get created, which are Docker images. Those Docker images then can be selected by the team that says this candidate is ready for production. We'll tag it as master or prod or whatever they do, and then it gets shipped off. So that's kind of where the, the handoff is typically after code commit and merge. Once everything's merged and there's some artifact, but honestly, it's how does your team work together? What's the best process for your application, right? I mean, there's just no cut and dry answer. So you just sort of have to figure it out, but there's some, there's some decent best practices there for you, I think. Yes. Good question. Okay, so um, yeah. Good point. So the question is, uh, we have a web container, we have a Postgres container, where's the actual like data from the database stored? So it's being stored, that was, was that right? Okay, good. Uh, it's being stored in the container, which is ephemeral, which means when you remove that container, it, that data goes away, which is okay in development, not so much in production. Okay, so on the Heroku side of things, I actually do a connection with their Heroku Postgres, uh, which sort of glosses over the actual difficulty of maintaining databases over time with containers. But what you would do is you would set up a volume that would map to a permanent location in the host. Um, and if anybody has a better way to do that, tell me later, but that's kind of my understanding. Uh, so essentially there's a, there's a spot on the hard drive somewhere that it maps to. Uh, with a volume and then it connects to that. Cool? That's a short answer anyway. Anybody else? Whew, gosh, let me off easy. Oh, ah. Uh. Yeah, uh, that's usually where you're going to have multiple Docker files. So when you start up the image, instead of saying just Docker file, you do Docker file dot prod or production or something like that. And it would kind of make the changes that are necessary to do the right stuff. Um, as long as most everything is okay, those small little settings aren't really going to affect how the environment is. It's just sort of this connects to this thing and this connects to this thing and it's a little, a little more cumbersome that way, but that it's it, it, usually you end up with more, multiple Docker files that way is mostly what I've seen. All right, yeah, one more. That, if I can what? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep. No, if anybody has questions that they don't want to ask, that's fine. Hit me afterwards while I'm shoving pizza in my face. Cool. Or singing karaoke. Seriously. Okay, I've beat, I beaten that one dead. All right, I think that's it. Thank you, everybody, for your time. I appreciate it. I was. Japan Town. I'm still on. <laughs> I'm still on, and I'm planning karaoke. <laughs> Thank you.
Cool. Awesome. Great. Now we have up our next speaker. This is Ilya from Weaveworks, and he's going to be giving us a practical guide to Prometheus for app developers. Hey, folks. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Yeah, good, 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 good. All right. So, yeah, I'm Ilya from Weaveworks. Uh, we, we are based down here in Trevor Hill. And uh, we also have an office in London. Actually, that's where I'm working out of. And um, today I'm going to, to give you a practical guide to Prometheus, uh, an app developer focused guide to Prometheus, right? The reason I'm doing this is because we believe that building a modern delivery pipeline without observability is a non starter. You got to put monitoring in place from the start. So, we're going to do a little bit of theory and uh, a step-by-step -step tutorial on using Prometheus with a Node.js app, okay? I should probably tell you a little bit more about Weaveworks. We started back in 2014. We built the first multi-host network for Docker that actually worked out of the box, Weavenet. It's now 2.0.4, I believe, and uh, it's been our flagship product ever since, and uh, it's got a Docker Swarm plugin, for example, as well as integrates with uh, Mesos and Kubernetes. Um, so after that, we've, we've done a lot more work in various fronts, including open source projects of our own, as well as contributing to cloud native foundation projects such as Prometheus and Kubernetes, and contributed to some parts of Docker as well, various stages. So today, we're going to use Swarm mode on Docker for Mac. And we're going to use a very basic Node.js app. Hey, we had Node.js in the previous talk. More Node.js, cool. All right, so um, just the basic stuff of what, what it really means to integrate Prometheus metrics into your app, what it really means to instrument your app for Prometheus. And uh, we'll cover how Prometheus works in the basic sense. And we will be using the cloud for uh, remote storage of Prometheus metrics. So we don't have to um, allocate any space for it on, on our development machine. And we can look at, for example, we could, we'd be able to look at behavior all the time while we're developing the app, right? And we can reset Docker storage. You don't have to do any of that. It's all stored remotely. So just to sort of illustrate that, here's a little diagram. So here's, here's our app. There's Prometheus running locally. This, this stuff in the, in, the, in the white box is, um, what's well, like, this stuff here, yeah, is, um, is running in your local Docker Swarm. There, there is your app. You could have multiple. Prometheus comes in and scrapes slash metrics, and uh, it uses a so-called remote write feature to store data remotely in the cloud. Here's you interact with like your, your app, you, you, you write the code, deploy that to Swarm, and um, you'd use PromQL in Vive Cloud, and you'd set up alerts there as well. We're not going to cover alerts today, unless we will have a lot of time left, which I, I do not believe is going to happen, but we'll see. Um, so what's Prometheus? Prometheus is a time series database for monitoring, purpose-built for monitoring, been inspired by a Google internal thing called Borgmon, but, but it's been built by like a couple of ex-Googlers who went to SoundCloud and uh, wanted to, to have a system that is just like the thing they had at Google. So they built Prometheus. Again, yeah, inspired by Borgmon. So it's a pool-based mo uh, monitoring system. Prometheus scrapes metrics for, from apps that are instrumented for it, and it stores them usually locally and uh, that, 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 is, that is okay, but then we recommend using remote storage and we are one of the remote storage providers for Prometheus. Um, the kind of the, the storage, the built-in local storage is fairly limited and you would end up in pretty complicated situations if you try to do HA or federation type stuff with it. So uh, it got the multi-dimensional data model so each sample gets a bunch of labels attached to it. 
and it's got a so it's got it's got a well we'll look at some of the concrete examples momentarily right so it's got a, a flat key namespace and uh, it's got a, a labels on top of that so we'll, we'll we'll take a look at some of the examples shortly well how does it work integrate it natively with uh, container orchestration systems uh, it usually does service discovery and uh, it finds the all the services that are it finds all the instances, all the containers within a service and Swarm, let's say, right? So in Kubernetes, we have pods, in like Mrs. Marathon, it would be tasks, uh, and in Swarm, it would be actually tasks as well, right? The container tasks in a service. And um, it expects service, services to present metrics endpoint. Usually, you'd use slash metrics. It usually uses HTTP, but you could use uh, HTTPS or gRPC. And um, you'd use PromQL language to query those metrics. And you can also use alerts to, to alert yourself whenever something goes wrong. Okay, so Beef Cloud runs Prometheus as a service. I'm happy to talk to you more about this, but today we're just gonna cover the basics of Prometheus for the most part. We'll be using Beef Cloud UI just because that's like an easy way to, to, to actually learn PromQL. And uh, yeah, let's just, let's just get on with it, right? So, so there, there's more to say there, right? So Vive Cloud um, is a, it's, it's like an extension to Prometheus. It's a, it's a, it's a backhand for remote storage, right? And once again, PromQL is a language which we'll learn momentarily. And uh, as I said, we might not be able to cover alerts today. So how does metrics endpoint look like? So we said, yeah, it's slash metrics by default. In this particular case, we've used Prometheus. Um, and uh, you can configure it to use different endpoints, right? So you can also configure it to use different port if you don't want to expose it on the same port where, where everything else connects to your app and such things, right? Uh, but like here, we're looking at one particular metric endpoint for, for, for some app. And uh, we can see a process start time seconds metric here. This is the, the metric name, the key. And uh, here, is the, um, here is the value. This really simple plain text format, right? Key space value. Well, we said it's got labels. How do we specify labels? Here is how you specify labels. So here's how HTTP metric would look like. HTTP request duration seconds count. Method get status 200 URI slash 2.0. So that means that we've seen two HTTP get requests on the URI slash, right? And we responded with 200 to both of these. And, um, and here is the Sphere request duration sum. So the, this pair of metrics is a, it represents a metric type summary, as here. But um, that's kind of advanced stuff. So just sort of giving you an idea of what the metric endpoint look like, right? So you, you don't really have to care about how to render this unless you, you're using some kind of unusual language. For most of the mainstream languages, there are official client libraries, right? So your, your, your client library for Prometheus will produce this. And it will integrate with your HTTP web app framework in order to obtain all the stats about the requests that, that the app has handled. So how do we query that? So here's a simple PromQL query. It's just a metric name, right? This will return a, a vector of um, process uptime values. So that's, that's kind of boring. So we can, we can narrow it down into, into a particular app. So let's say job, my app. And then, yeah, well, I mean, all we got is process uptime, right? Most of the time we kind of care about things like, things that matter to us, matter to our users, let's say HTTP, right? So here is an HTTP query. Well, this also gets us HTTP request duration, second counts for all the, all the, the different apps there maybe that expose this. So you'd normally try to 
uh, make all of your apps expose the same metric names, right? They may have like extra labels or whatnot, uh, depending on what kind of app that is, but like you try to, to, to make them all be like for all the HTTP requests, you would want to have HTTP request duration seconds. And then this is, this is, as we said, summary, right? So it's got a count and a sum, which was so earlier, but we're not covering all those details of Prometheus. Let's just get to, to what, what it really looks like in practice. So you can go, go home and learn a bit more about it. So here's a, here's a more specific query for that same metric. We specified job my app method get URI slash. So this, this will get us all the um, um, request starts for, for those particular requests for that particular app, right? All the get requests on slash for my app. Okay. Um, actually, we can sum that all up. So let's say we'd return multiple, multiple things for different instances of that app with different containers, right? So we make a sum of that, and then we kind of have one, one time series metric. So without the sum, you'd basically get multiple lines depending on how many, how many instances of the app you got. And with a sum, you'll get just one line, an aggregate follow of those. And we could also call other functions such as rate. So we do a sum of rates of that. So that would give you a graph where, where, where you would see flat lines for like sort of steady state. And whenever there are spikes, that would, be, that would mean that, that you got more requests coming through. And we'll look at some of these in detail shortly. Uh, another interesting metric in Prometheus, a kind of magic metric that, that is built into Prometheus is up. Up is a metric that Prometheus records one or zero for when, 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 when it's able or not able to uh, fetch slash metric endpoint from the app. So uh, we'll look at that in more detail. And so here we can look at all the, the, the app metrics for, for my app. And uh, we can sum those by job, and then we'll get a, basically a total number of instances that are healthy for that particular app. So this is a very brief introduction. Let's get to the practical side of things, right? Any questions so far? Please. Question. So, um, well, this, this will return. So, so if I have five tasks in Swarm, right? If I have a service, if my app is a service scale six or five, that will return me six or five or whatever that is, right? It's an interesting metric to be aware of, right? Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Any more questions so far? Please. Okay, so it would usually use service discovery, right? It would usually look at like a DNS record, for example, and get all the entries in, a, in an A record and look at all of those individually. Okay. We get to go to the next step. There'll be more time for questions later. Okay, folks. Right, so we said we're going to use Docker Swarm or Docker for Mac, Swarm mode. We're going to I have some JavaScript code. It's fairly simple, so if any of you are not familiar with JavaScript, you should be able to, to, to get along, uh, follow along. So, um, yeah, so we're gonna tell you a little story about a startup for launching a very simple greeting service, right? We all know those little greeting services. <laughs> um, so we, we're gonna launch a little greeting service, and uh, we, we're gonna have to get ready for, um, for, for a lot of visitors, right? We're gonna get ready for like millions of people being greeted by our great greeting service, right? It's gonna be very simple at the beginning. And uh, we kind of plan to, to, to add more features like, you know, sort of like second guessing who, who you, what your name may be sometime next week perhaps. Right now it's, it's gonna be the same for everybody. We don't have personalization just yet. All right, let's move on. Um, so, Uh, let me bring up my terminal. All 
All right. So we've uh, we've got the first version of this um, service. It's written in JavaScript. It's really, really, really simple written service, right? Uh, it says very simple plain text messages over HTTP. So to deploy this, you're going to run Docker build uh, t-maya v1 dot. All right, cool. That's quick. Um, Docker stack deploy. We call this stack demo, and uh, it should should be deployed. Yeah. All right. So we should be able to curl localhost 8080. Tada. All right. It's not on the internet yet. I don't know if we'll make it today, but we'll get ready for, for a little load, right? We're going to run like Apache Bench. Okay. Yay. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's still working, right? Um, seems like it's happy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Nearly there. All right. Still, still standing. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Well, um, yeah, but we, we kind of want to know, we want to leave for a little while and come back and like find out what the numbers are, right? We want to know what, what kind of uh, quality of service we provide to our, our customers that we greet so kindly. Um, so we're going to go and check out our next version where somebody um, thought they could just do something very, very simple. Uh, doc, uh, we run Docker build. Um, this is v2. Okay, Docker stack deploy. Okay, so let's look at the code while well, well, that's starting up. So we've added a little hits endpoint and a, and a little counter variable, right? So we add those uh, up and like every time somebody hits slash, we add up, um, we add one to, to, to the counter and, uh, and like if, if, a, if an admin looks at slash hits, they'll find out how many visitors the app has seen. Brilliant. And uh, I, I think someone wrote like this uh, amazing script here. Um, collect samples, yeah. It's, it's a very simple um, um, load observation tool, right? Saves um, samples into, into a little CSV file. That's brilliant. Okay, um, let's, um, let's just make sure that, that this is working. So we hit it three times and we go to hits, we got the three, brilliant. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, well, maybe we could like scale it up before we run Apache Bench again. Yeah, it's this one, scale. Uh, how was it? Um, yeah, right. We'll we'll make it six. Yeah, that's that's a good number. Um, yeah. Okay. One, two. Mm. Right. So. Um, oh. Okay. Yeah, that's still working. Run Apache Bench again. And in another terminal, we're run, gonna run collect samples. So Docker. This is collecting our samples. Uh, yeah, so we're going to get some samples here and uh, maybe we'll run Apache Bench a couple of times and just sort of like get some more samples. Um, okay, cool. So uh, who can guess what, what would go wrong here? Like and what, what, how useful this, this little CSV file would be? I mean, let, let me show you what it really looks like by now, right? Um, Sample CSV. So, I mean, I don't know. I can see a lot of numbers, right? I, I'm, I may be able to write some program that will plot it. Um, but like, oh, hold on a moment. Like, if I if I look here, two one three seven two one eight nine two two. Okay, hmm. two one three seven. Yeah, I mean, I'm not entirely sure how these numbers really line up. Uh, let me just kind of try and have a look at this. Uh, it's, it's, oh. oh, this, this is definitely increasing. Okay. Uh, uh, but like, hold on, isn't, isn't this like, you know, there's a global variable in each of the instances and it's like, it's kind of a bit weird, right? How, how does it even work in? I mean, I, I've got a lot of doubts about this, this little load testing um, solution, right? 
So gone and read. What, 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 what's like a good way to, to, to observe performance of um, containerized apps? And I found out about this thing called Prometheus. Oh, cool. Let's, let's try and introduce that. So we go and read some docs and, um, and find out how to, to, to do some basic Prometheus metrics, right? So we've introduced this third version of the app. And uh, we've added slash metrics here. And we learned that it, uh, all, it, uh, all Prometheus expects is like really simple key value thing, right? So we do HTTP request total and we render our counter. We wrap this heats counter in a, a constant object. So supposedly that's a better type of thing. It's, it's um, you know, it's not your, your old JavaScript as a new JavaScript. So you got constants. Um, okay, cool. So um, let's deploy this. Docker, uh, Docker build. So this is v3, right? Okay. Um, so, and, uh, and then we, we can update our Docker stack file. And uh, we've added um, a Prometheus container uh, that, that talks to Weave Cloud. And we don't have to care about storing this data locally <laughs> or like allocating the Docker volume or whatever. So, um, so yeah, cool. Let's deploy this. Docker stack ploy. Cool. So now we can hit localhost. Oh. All right. And if I hit metrics, yeah, I can see that HTTP request total there, right? If I hit slash again, I can see that. Is my Apache bench still running? Let's run another Apache bench, right? And now Weave Cloud should be able to show me. So first of all, I mean, I can see in Weave Cloud Explorer that, that there is this, um, uh, there's this Mobi host that, that is my Docker for Mac. And uh, in services, I can see my app and Prometheus. I look at my app. I can uh, look at the container, look at its logs. Is logging anything? Oh, maybe I forgot to turn on logging. Um, that's okay. So um, we can do various things here. We can look at CPE usage. Oh, that didn't work. All right. Anyway, we can go to monitor now. And we can take a look at app metric that we, we talked about earlier, right? So if we look at app as a table, we can see that there is one job, my app, uh, and, uh, and it's currently, the, the, the value for that is currently one. If I click on the job label, I uh, populate the, the expression with that particular label, and I can, I can narrow it down, but there are no other jobs to look at right now, right? All right, oh, so there are like different two instances. Okay, so just to be clear, that that's like, that's like the, the old one, and this is a new one now, but um, let's not get caught up on that. That's details of how Prometheus works. Um, let's, let's scale it up, right? That's kind of boring, Docker scale. A Docker service scale, isn't it? Let's scale it back to six. Okay, so in Prometheus should be able to, to, to notice all the, the new containers there. One of the table. So instance is the, the container IP address in this case, right? Yeah, now we can see that there are three, four, six, six instances there, right? We said sum of job by job. And uh, we can see that the number for that is six, which is, which is the number of instances we have in this service. Okay, what else we can do? I mean, we can, we can keep running Apache Bench and just observing like the basics of this, right? So, uh, the, so, so here we will keep watching whether but the, the thing is still alive. And here we can look at the HTTP requests. So my, uh, my little metric here was HTTP request total, right? This is the metric I've added to my app. So I'm gonna look at HTTP request total as a table first. So I can see there are six instances here. Oh, damn it. Uh, some of them seen a lot of requests. 
All right. Well, this Wi-Fi is pretty good. Didn't kill it as Apache Bench just yet. That happened before, but local Wi-Fi is pretty good, right? But this is not a big conference. It's just a meetup, right? So the Wi-Fi is still okay. You're not, you're not hammering the Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. So, um, so yeah, I can, can look at this. Well, this is, this is, this we can see is like, if we look here, we can see that, if we look back at the table, sorry. Uh, if we look back at the table, we can see that there are, you know, six separate time series. So we kind of want to add them up because we don't really care about how many requests each of the instances handled. Uh, we'll just look at the total for all of them. And we can see that, damn it, it's got like a lot of requests coming through, but I've got no timing information here whatsoever, right? So this is just really basic stuff. I just got a basic counter in Prometheus and, uh, and I got zero timing information. So like, I mean, I can, I can go and roll my own Prometheus client, but I think maybe that's not really a good idea. So as you can see here, we're just like, you know, we, we rendered the Prometheus metrics by hand essentially, right? We kind of like hand coded that Prometheus support in our app. So that's nice, but like, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's actually much easier to introduce a client library and that's what we're going to look at next. Uh, so git checkout v4 from client. Uh, actually, the, the program became much smaller now, much shorter. We also added like a proper framework because you should be using a framework, right? You don't want to be using like the core library for your HTTP stuff. Um, we're using Restify and we're using this uh, Epimetheus, which is, which is like apparently some, some other thing from, from Greek mythology. Um, um, and um, it's like a brother of Prometheus or something. So we're using that. And we're still serving on like port 80. We're still doing a very similar greeting. Now we also tell people that we're in stealth mode because we're still figuring it out. All right, so, so right, uh, let's, uh, let's deploy this. Docker build, this is v4. Okay, Docker stack deploy once again. We update that. So if we look at, this is dead. All right, okay, here we go. So this is a new version, metrics. And we can see a lot more metrics on slash metrics endpoint, right? Uh, a bunch of like low level Node.js stuff, like BMGC stats, stuff like that. If that's the kind of thing you're into, there's plenty for you to, to look at. I don't really know most of these things, but like max FDs sort of sticks to me, but I'm hoping with Docker, I don't really have to care about like the file descriptor limits and things like that, just in case I got them there. And the uh, process uh, like memory starts, might have to look at that one day. Right now, I really haven't really implemented much here yet. I trust my framework, hopefully it doesn't leak. So um, I just wanna know how fast my app is really responding, right? So I've got all the metrics I possibly want here, right? like HTTP request duration seconds. And uh, I got them by quantiles. And all the status codes are here path and um, a method, right? And I've got my, um, yeah, so this, this, this is my, my HTTP request duration second summary. And uh, I've got Instagram as well. And those are some of the advanced topics you might wanna learn from Ethi's documentation. Today we're just gonna take a look at how do we use that. Okay. So let's go back to our Wave Cloud console and try to, to to do some from QL here. Well, I've I've saved the really I've saved the really basic notebook already. Uh, so here I got the um, sum of uh, HTTP first durations. Sure, refresh this. So, okay, um, and um, yeah, let's 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 run our good old Apache bench, right? And just like get this graphs to, to squiggle and make sure it works. I mean, that's like squiggly line is like how you tell it works, right? And then we'll look at the details. Um, probably fast enough, but it's running locally. So we'll have to take that into account. So we're running an Apache bench again. 
Um, you can see, well, yeah, yeah, it's working. Okay, huh, great. Uh, and here we, we, we look at the, uh, just this sort of overall sum, and here we look at the rate. So, so the sum will stay up, uh, and the, 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 the I rate, instantaneous rate, that, that, will, um, that will go down once Apache Bench exits, right? The, 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 the sum will keep growing, Apache Bench will, will stay the same. Well, sort of, like, I mean, not, I'll, I'll show you in a moment what I, what I mean. So, it, well, it doesn't keep growing, but it, flat, it stays flat, right? So this, this is just the counter, and I rate is the instantaneous rate of that same counter. Okay, so this, this dropped because Apache Bench exited. Cool, all right, let's run more Apache Benches uh, and, uh, and find out more here. But what we can tell, what we can tell about this app? Uh, well, I mean, the counts is something we've already seen. Let's take a look at um, uh, actual centiles for this. So, um, so if we look at CP request directions, some and look at it as a table. Oh, I tell you what, I've, I, I need to scale it back up again. Because I, I, it's boring when I have only one instance. Docker scale, that service scale. And in fact, I'm going to go in higher. I'm going to aim for like 12 perhaps. Because why not? Right? Well, well, like we already should have six in here. So if I look at this as a table, all right, this did not come up yet. Very confused. Well, Prometheus haven't quite discovered them yet. It's using DNS service discovery yet at the moment, and um, uh, we're looking to to implement. Swarm specific features soon. If that's something you're particularly interested in, come and talk to me and we'll, we'll figure out how soon we can get that done. Uh, so, um, yeah, so DNS takes a little while to, to update. Um, I'm happy to take questions at this point too. Fire up another Apache bench and got a bit more data. Yes, please. Uh, Prometheus, sorry, can you repeat the question? So I think you are asking whether Prometheus can. Um, Okay, yeah, so can, can Prometheus do auto-scaling on Docker Swarm? Uh, the answer is that it won't do that directly. You can implement an auto-scaler that would react to a Prometheus alert, for example. That makes sense? Okay, because Prometheus does, doesn't actually know how to like make changes to your cluster, right? That would be kind of not the right thing to do. It's, uh, it, 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 does, it does one thing and does it well as in observing um, metrics and uh, sending out alerts and such things. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, so Prometheus is not a tracing system. The question was whether Prometheus does tracing, and the answer is not. Uh, if you're interested in tracing, please take a look at other CNCF projects such as uh, Jaeger. More questions there? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's right. I mean, uh, what we recommend uh, looking at is uh, so-called red metrics, as in um, it's it's kind of an analogous to to the use method by Brennan Gregg. Um, like 
computer falling asleep just a second let me not follow this uh, make it leave it like that because it's running apache bench that's very important right um so um yeah so uh the the method we recommend is a uh, red method so that's requests error rates and durations right If you have to, yeah, you. I'd probably start with like logs. Uh, there are a few, but uh, the, the, it is more the case like Prometheus is. Um, you know, like there are so many ways to do things with it. It leaves you so much freedom that um, a lot of dashboards you may find on GitHub might not just work right out of the box, right? Unless you're doing things in the same way that uh, people who wrote those dashboards do. So um, like metric names, for instance, right? That's a big one. And uh, the, um, the other thing I wanted to add is that there, there are dashboards uh, that, that should be quite useful out of the box, which are to do with like node resources on Prometheus. And uh, I should be able to find you some of those. Okay, thank you. More questions over there? Thank you, please. Uh, dynamic routing at what layer? Oh, like load balancing, right? Right, so um, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of, yeah, it's a completely separate problem, yeah. So uh, you, you could instrument your load balancer with Prometheus, like for example, for Nginx, there, there's Nginx exporter, uh, or you just use like a cloud-based load balancer, and if you, if you use uh, ELB, for example, you can uh, export the um, ELB metrics, which are usually uh, things you'd find in, um, in your CloudWatch, you, you can use a CloudWatch exporter to bring that into Prometheus and correlate that with your app instrumentation metrics. Okay, makes sense? Yes, please. So it doesn't, it shouldn't really matter because it's usually on the internal network. You can uh, use HTTPS, uh, you can use TLS, uh, or you, know, you can use some kind of authentication, you can configure client certificates if you'd like. Uh, and you, you can do all that kind of stuff if you want. You want to, to add extra security. But normally it is not the kind of sensitive data that, that you'd be worried too much about. Uh, and uh, if you just want to encrypt that on the local network, you could, if you, if you have some kind of CA set up internally that just works out of the box, Prometheus will pick that up, right? So if, if, you, if you have some, some kind of like um, the domain of your own for which you, you, you are issuing certificates and you have those certificates on certain paths on the system, you can configure that, you can configure Prometheus to use that. Or if you, if you want to do authentication on top of uh, the metrics endpoint, you can also do that. Yeah. Oh, uh, so Oh, so you, you're you're thinking about exposing things externally? Uh, no, it, at no point I, I was suggesting anything like that. So if we go back to my diagram here, um, so uh, we so essentially, yeah. So you you can uh, what we what uh, what I'm using here right now uh, is um, like an app running in in in, your, in my swarm. And the Prometheus server running in my swarm too. And the Prometheus server has local storage disabled. It has no local storage and it uses remote write capability to send metrics out to the cloud. 
right? So Prometheus server itself is a forwarder. Okay. Very good question. Thank you. Okay. Right. So Prometheus on its own has support for local storage, uh, but that's like just like your local storage, right? Unless you have some kind of NAS configured for that, you 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 still like write into a local disk basically. Uh, and if you if you want some redundancy, you would have to run multiple Prometheus servers uh, servers, and you would have to essentially like merge that data and figure out when there are like gaps in the data, which which of those you have to care about or not. So the clustering solution out of the box is very primitive. And that's why we built Leaf Cloud remote storage. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But you would still use uh, you would still run in your in your cluster, you would still run Prometheus Docker image from Docker Hub, the official one, with the remote write in your configuration file pointing at Leaf Cloud. So at this point, we provide a notebook UI that, that, that is mostly focused on exploring from QL capabilities and um, configuring alerts and um, things like incident response, right? Where, where you want to, to collect a bunch of graphs that tell a certain story. And if you want to use Grafana, you can just configure the, your Grafana instance to, to talk to Viv Cloud. And there are multiple ways of doing that, please. Alert manager actually lives in Vive Cloud. You can you can also make alert manager uh, run in your system as well, uh, but it, it's easier to configure it with in Vive Cloud. So, apart from remote write, there is also also remote read. So you can actually access all the data in this local Prometheus instance. Uh, no, it's like you, you, if you want to run Alert Manager here, you, you just configure it to talk to this Prometheus here. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, you just put your Alert Manager configuration in VivCloud and, uh, it, and configure whatever Slack or whatever integrations you'd like. Okay. More questions here? Please. Yeah, please. So, uh, does Vif? Uh, so we we provide Prometheus API exclusively, right? So we we don't we don't support um, other things, like you know what kind of things you think enough exactly. Like other monitoring subsystem, like right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is for Prometheus, right? Because Prometheus says the best open source monitoring system that we know. Of. Please. Okay, so Prometheus is open source. It's a CNCF project. Datadog is proprietary, uh, and uh, Datadog gives you nice visualizations, but it doesn't give you give you access to to, to a rich query language like PromQL. I don't know about their alerting capabilities. They may be similar to Prometheus. Um, but yeah, so one of the the key things about Prometheus is that it's open source and it's a cloud native foundation project. And um, we will run it as a service, but still, you know, the, the API would be still fully compatible with the open source Prometheus. Does that answer your question to any extent? Or do, do you want some more detailed comparison? 
Okay, yeah, that, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I need to get my colleagues to, to kind of get you more information. I may maybe running out the depths here <laughs> on one by one comparison type stuff. Please, more questions. We still got a few minutes, right? Got plenty of time. All right, we got like 15 minutes. We can. All right. Oh, yeah, good question. Yeah, we still got more questions. Let's do that. Yeah. Like, like memory usage of tickle out. Yeah, so I mean, um, so we, we looked at our metrics for this up earlier, right? So it had, where was this? So we got like CPU starts here and um, Node.js heap size. So like, well, let's look at that, right? Node.js heap size used bytes. Um, let's add this to our notebook. So over time, you know, we've been making requests to these apps and we can see that uh, rendering this as a graph. So what it looks like, most of the, most of the instances are kind of on the, sa at the same level, but one of them is, uh, seems, seems to use more, more heap. Just a tiny bit more. I don't know how much more that is, really. But 11, 22, 13. All right, well, maybe just didn't garbage collect. Let's, let's zoom out and see. see uh, I'm looking at like last five minutes, so let me zoom out. Last 15 minutes may make more sense. All right, well, yeah, I mean, they're roughly equivalent, right? So yeah, so this is, this is provided by the, uh, by the Node.js client. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so clients vary. If you're, if, you're, if you're looking at a particular client and it doesn't quite satisfy you, take a look if there are, there are better versions out there or if you have to update it, maybe there are some changes that landed in master and not like in the release version you're using. And uh, you know, if, you, if you're thinking of, of any features that need to be added and the plugin is unmaintained, do make a call and uh, I'm sure community would pick it up from there. And if you're not finding any help, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's 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 a great question. Yeah. So, I think um, so. We kind of have like the 99% of Prometheus API supported right now, and I think that falls into the 1% that we 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 haven't implemented yet. So just being able to, like a normal PromQL query would be, um, you would say like app, no job my app, that's that, right, right? So job my app, let me see, maybe this has been added recently. So, so you do this and this will give you all the, the metrics there are for that, for that job. We're on a stable, oh yeah, we added that, brilliant. Okay, so something I wasn't up to date on. I think a couple of months ago, this wasn't in. So th this tells you that you know all the all the metrics you got for, uh, which contain the job my app label, and the job my app label is inserted automatically. So if I if I just do the um, curly braces, I think maybe maybe this is, this is the one that we don't support right now. Okay, so for a particular job. Uh, we have this, right? So this gets you essentially, oops, this gets you all the same things. Damn it. All right, well, I got the reporter bug here. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll do it again. Job, uh, my app, and um, yeah, this gets me, me all the metrics for that particular app. All the things there are, right? Um, all right, did not give me metric names. Another bug I found. So clearly, this is a recent feature. Um, I'll have to to go and report a bug on that. But essentially, yeah, the, the, this should should give me all the things that I would get from slash metric standpoint for that particular app over time. So if if the, the set of metrics changes, which which it actually does. So for example, when app starts up, 
this particular client doesn't expose any metrics for HTTP requests until it has seen some HTTP requests, right? So the, the, the set changes over time. So that feature is quite useful to learn what things there are that you may not catch if you just look at metrics and point as, it, as it's rendered by a particular app instance. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay, cool, thanks. Good question. We got more questions here or we're gonna go and try and do a load thing, which I wasn't exactly prepared for. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll have to pray the demo guards. All right, so um, should we do that? Or people want to see? Yeah, okay. Um, so far, the demo guard's been good with me. Alerting. All right, so right now, there's no alert manager configured here. Okay. Okay, well, in fact, actually, I think there, there's a bug to do with Swarm version. Um, let me take a look at the different version here, different instance. Um, Oh, I think that's just gone in different location in the menu. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, I have my alerting rules here, so I could add some default rules, for example. So these are... Uh, right, so these are based on Kubernetes and Node Explorer, so these won't work. I'd have to create one of my own. So I'm just going to copy this as it is and uh, um, change this. No jobs, right? And uh, I'm going to say that sum of up is equal to zero. For one minute, severity critical, and I'm going to remove this annotation from here. So this, this should alert me if all if you know there are no scrape targets that we can scrape from so we, we add all the app metrics and we get a zero damn it nothing's running um all right so an alert manager receivers let me copy one i did earlier this is this is the bit i do not remember <laughs> so um all right well i think this guy had it Load receivers, all right, yeah, this looks like, oh yeah, this, this looks good to me. So I'll go to like request bin, and uh, this will be a webhook type alert, right? Um, create request bin, I copy this thing. All right, this should work actually, yeah. I had issues with Slack having like too many steps and never remembering things in Slack UI. So, okay, so this looks good, I think. Damn it, indentation. Okay. Uh, receivers. Oh, yeah. So this thing has to go in here. I think this is about right. Okay, cool. So, all right. So now, if I go in on the Docker stack, um, RM demo. So this should get rid of all of my jobs. Um, and the sum of, oh, hold on a sec, no. In fact, <laughs> uh, this also get rid of Prometheus server, uh, stack deploy. Um, Docker stack scale. A server scale. I now just make this service scale zero, right? But I mean, let me go and check things before, before we go. So my up metric right now, sum of, sum of up, because that's what we created alert for. Sum of up right now is 12. 
Oh, how amazing it's the, oh yeah so i'm going to scale it to zero i killed it but probably did not realize it yet have one so we kind of make an observation that that definitely happens let's wait a little while okay so there's definitely one thing there as i said dns takes a little while to update unfortunately we need the proper swarm integration, which is coming soon. Yeah, I mean, I could actually go and create another one down below. Make that table. So that's definitely a thing. Well, how about I go and um, change this to like, you know, just to test the alert. I really don't care about uh, it being uh, so meaningful, right? I'm gonna make it um, less than 50. It's definitely less than 50. Save, so that should fire shortly. Okay. So has it sent something here? Oh, this just tells me, shows me examples. All right, in URL, I just go there. Okay, all right, just, I forgot how to use request bin. Um, where do I see the actual requests? <laughs> oh, just refresh the page. Oh, yeah. All right, so I think we have seen the, so is this count, this come from user agent Mozilla? Oh no, that's me. Okay, got it. Let's wait. Yeah, so this is the one request that has seen so far. And um, if I look at my firing alerts here, let's see, has it been firing? Oh, I've told it to be like five minutes, right? So, all right, we got to wait a little. One minute? Okay, well, that should be, should be firing soon. Um, Load receivers. So I'm just going to test this, make sure that I get request bin. Fresh. All right. So we've seen a curl request. Oh, here, go HTTP client, right? So we got a, um, we got an alert here. And it tells me that, what does it tell me? So this is a bit of JSON. I'm just going to like put that into JQ. Um, so, so I got like a request being receiver, that's just the receiver name, no jobs, critical, okay? So here's an alert working. I mean, obviously this was like 50 jobs, but I just didn't want to make you wait for so long here to, to just see this. So this, this is particularly representative, but let, let's see now what, what we got. Maybe we should be able to test where zero jobs works. So if I go here to file an alerts. I should see this alert firing. I go back to my um, notebook. I'll try my app metric. What is it? All right, still thinks it's for 13. Um, it's kind of weird. Why, why does it think that, that this, uh, okay. I thought this should be zero by now. All right, it's clearly some homework to do, maybe some settings to tweak in my config. Okay. Thanks for getting me to do this. I'm usually quite lazy and skip that part, and I know this is the most exciting part of it probably. Yes, please. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll store it for you based on which package you choose. Yeah. So you, you, could, you could do like internally, if you, if you do Prometheus Federation type stuff, you can do a lot of different things, but it's pretty complicated to run, right? So people would have like different retention for different level of verbosity of metrics. And that's something people do, but with Wave Cloud, you just store everything. And um, yeah, it's like, we will take care of that. You don't, I mean, obviously it depends like well, whether you think you'd be paying less for, for certain things and we can figure that out for you. 
like yeah the, like i mean like number of samples you store for older data like sort of the, the sampling interval for all data and, and kind of like the labels that you keep and the labels you throw away over time okay thank you very much thanks very much uh, all, all good questions thank you so much it was a pleasure thank you